Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ted Wapham. I'm Dean of the Ann and Joe O'Neuhoff School of Ministry at the University of Dallas. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's uh, Faith Connect presentation. Uh, we are putting on this series of virtual workshops um, in partnership with the Diocese of Dallas uh, and the University of Dallas Ministry Conference. Uh, and our goal is to um, explore topics uh, and the challenges that have been facing us uh, during uh, 2020. Uh, it really has been a remarkable year uh, between um, the, the unrest in our society, the political divisions, the, the uh, pandemic, um, everyone being kind of in isolation. We just really felt that it was particularly important this year to bring resources to people in their homes uh, to reflect on how they can live a life of faith and uh, to get answers to questions. So as a part of that conversation tonight, uh, we will be uh, having a conversation on raising faith-filled ki kids uh, with Jillian and Pam from the Faith and Family Collective. Uh, Pam Hurwitz and Jillian Rhodes are a mother-daughter daughter team and co-founders of Faith and Family Collective. Their website is faithandfamilycollective.com. We'll be putting that up in our chat box uh, in just a moment. So for those of you that are, that are on, you can go check out their webpage after their presentation. Um, I highly recommend it. It's filled with all kinds of excellent resources uh, for, for you to share. Uh, and they are uh, part of the Faith and Family Catholic Ministries. They share over 30 years of ministry with children teens, adults, and families in the Diocese of Orange, California. Their education includes multiple degrees in theology and pastoral ministry from Loyola Marymount University and Boston College. They themselves are faith-filled, funny, relevant, inspirational, and innovative. We're so excited to have them with us today because they're a valuable resource for schools, ministries, parishes, and committed to helping you all find new ways to better serve the domestic church. Jillian and Pam, thank you so much for being with us and uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, we are honored to be with you. And we have a, um, a big net here because we have been told that we probably have some catechists, some um, parents, um, some DREs, all different types of people that are either, you know, all obviously in families or working with families. And so we are going to put out um, into the deep, a nice big net. And we hope that every single one of you will find something to take away from your time here. To begin, I'm just gonna ask you if you could get a piece of paper and a pen just really quickly, wherever you are, just I'll give a couple of minutes for you to grab that, a piece of paper and a pen. Okay, um, before even introducing ourselves a bit, I wanted to um, tell you a little story. And the story is about um, a young girl named Teresa who was married to a young man named Joe. And they lived in Belgium. They lived in Belgium and they were raising three girls and a son. And during this time, there wasn't a lot of work in Belgium and some of the farming was really struggling. And so Joe and um, Teresa began praying about their next steps to support their family. And Joseph came to her and said, you know what? I really feel like we need to go to the United States. And they had heard about this um, country of new opportunities. And so Joseph made the decision to come to the United States and begin to prepare to bring his wife and four children. So when he got to the United States, he moved into a Flemish community of people who spoke the same language and who attended the same church together. And he started um, looking for work and preparing to have his family come. 
Meanwhile, Teresa and her three, her three daughters and sons, son were living with her parents and they were getting a little frustrated. Um, and, and finally, they just said one day, you know what, I know Joe keeps writing, but I think you need to be with him. And so they put her and the four kids on a boat headed to the United States. And these kids got so sick. All of them got so sick. She got so sick. And when they arrived at Ellis Island, they were kind of snot nosed, um, coughing, and they kind of had, you know, a person, somebody who was sitting in front of them that was kind of determining, especially their health before they entered the United States. And so Teresa, who didn't speak a word of English, a word of English, she was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get in. And the kids are sneezing and coughing. And she, and she tell, told the story that somehow this poor guy must have felt bad for her and stamped her, um, her visa and let her into the United States. So she came into the United States with her four children. She reunited with her husband and they began to build a life in the United States. They were Catholic and they managed to find a community of other people from Belgium gym who were raising their kids Catholic and they would share their faith at home and at church and um, they were beginning to work on a home and things were looking pretty good for them. Um, there was a problem um, that was kind of lurking and that was that Joe the husband was struggling with some mental illness and so he um, actually just completely at wit's ends he committed suicide. And so now we have Teresa and her four kids in the United States without a husband, still barely speaking English and trying to figure out how she would provide for them. And her decision was to move her family um, into a city and she moved into close into the city of Chicago. And so she was in Chicago and um, the depression was going on and she would gather her family at night her and the um, four kids, and they would bead purses. And as they beaded these purses together, they would pray the rosary. And somehow God paid their rent. And this went on for quite a while. And then her um, kids began to get a little bit older and her youngest daughter, Marie, actually decided she would like to be a secretary. And so she went and found work in the city of Chicago as a secretary. And one day she was having lunch on her lunch break and a young man by the name of Morris caught her eye and he was biking in the park and they began a conversation. He also was from Belgium and they ended up falling in love and getting married. And they ended up moving up to a suburb of Chicago called Elmwood Park. And they raised two daughters, Audrey and Jeannie, in Elmwood Park outside of the city. And about four doors down from them, they met another um, Catholic family whose last name was Honakal. And they had two daughters and a son. And that son, his name was Larry, and their daughter, Jeannie, ended up falling in love. And those two ended up getting married. Those two ended up getting married. And they decided to make the big move and come to California. They had heard about this, all the opportunity in California. And so Larry and Jeannie moved to California and they moved actually um, into a little growing area called Orange, the city of Orange. And they proceeded to have a daughter and three sons and they named their daughter Pam and I am that daughter, I am that daughter. And I tell this story as we begin because faith is really passed down and shared through our families, the stories that happened, the experiences, positive, negative. The, there's so many other pieces to that story that I have been told over and over and over again that have brought me to this moment. So I just want to remind each of us, whether you're sitting on this as a parent, as, as a catechist, however, wherever you find yourself this morning, this afternoon, this evening, <laughs> this evening <laughs> we are funny, okay, <laughs> is sacred ground, is sacred ground, is a place that has been prepared for you, has been prepared for you, and that there is opportunity, 
And there is opportunity for us to also follow in the footsteps of these people from our own families who have passed on and passed on this faith. So I want to begin by um, asking each of you to write down on a piece of paper the name of someone who had an impact um, and passed faith on to you. Someone who had an impact in your life and, and, and is, is responsible for really passing on faith into your life. And now if you could just hold that paper and look at that person's name and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. And loving God, um, you have called people since the beginning of time to follow you. And we are so blessed to be able to follow in the footsteps of generations who have worshiped and sought and struggled and sacrificed and rejoiced in your goodness. Help us, God, to be those people in our own lives, to be leaders, to be people who live out loud, people who share faith in our own families and in the midst of the families that we work with or serve. May we be reminded that the ground we stand on is sacred and that there is, and that the world is just drenched with opportunities to see and share you. And so may we um, open ourselves to this experience tonight and may it somehow um, help us in the ministries that we each are called to. Amen. So we tell that story um, in way of saying that we believe in the power of a family. Family is such an opportunity because in our homes and our families, that's where we first learn how to forgive, how to share ourselves, how to say, I'm sorry, how to love, um, how to share mercy with one another. And we believe that it's no mistake that Jesus came to this earth by way of a family because families are so, so incredibly formational to who we are. Um, as he said, we are a mother and daughter team. This is my real life mom. Um, and it is because of the intentional time we spent together as a family that we are sitting here doing this together today. Um, I did just wanna preface before we introduce ourselves fully, but um, we are a real life, messy, chaotic, overwhelmed, crazy family. But I will say that my parents um, were really instrumental in how I experienced faith. Um, they were very intentional in the way they shared faith in our home and talk about, talked about faith in our home. It really was kind of the essence and the warmth um, of our home and really allowed me to um, learn a lot about myself and my faith in um, just a really natural kind of um, almost rhythmic way in our home. I went to Catholic school my entire life and was a part of a religious education program, um, which were awesome and also for more formational. But I really will say that um, just having my parents who were true examples of living out their faith um, meant more than probably any of that, just their example. So thank you. Um, and I'm really grateful for that because I know a lot of people um, don't have that same experience. But we are, um, my name is Jillian. This is my mom, Pam. We're a Faith and Family Collective. And our mission is to um, empower and to encourage families to share faith in their home in simple and meaningful ways and to spend quality and intentional time together. We speak, we create tons of different resources, um, and we also partner with schools and parishes. Our resources are very family friendly, they're hands on, engaging, interactive, and written in a way that is um, very easily understood by families in very family friendly language. We speak three to five times a week, um, even via Zoom, um, and have shared over 30 years of ministry in the Diocese of Orange. We're from Orange County, and we just feel really blessed to be living this dream out together. 
Um, our objective for this evening is we want to talk about the opportunity that we have in equipping parents to share faith at home. Um, at, to begin, we're going to try to inspire you a little bit um, and talk about the why, why, we, why that's important, and then we're going to dive into the how. Um, all, everything we talk about tonight is born out of our own experience in our home or in working with other people in ministry. And um, let's begin. <laughs> and at the end, we will take questions. So as we're talking, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat box the or chat. on Facebook, and we'll go over them at the end. Okay. My um, kind of best image that I have found for parenting, and one that has um, I've shared again and again, is um, is from actually a commencement speech that I heard at the University of Oregon as my son was graduating. And there was a man that was speaking and he had wrote a book called Watering the Bamboo. And he was talking to the students uh, and using this book um, as a way to talk about leadership and moving forward from, from college. But the entire time he was talking, I was hearing this as the greatest, um, the greatest analogy of what it means to really parent. And so he used this analogy of growing bamboo and, but not just regular bamboo, growing giant timber bamboo. And giant timber bamboo is a resource and it grows immensely, immensely high. And it's very, very tough. And when you, even the, even the little pieces of it are almost impossible to break. And they use it as a resource, they build homes and, um, and boats with it. It can thrive in all different types of temperatures. It's very resilient, strong, almost unbreakable. And so he was telling us what you have to do to actually grow giant timber and bamboo. And what would happen is farmers would go out and um, they would plant seeds in the ground and they would come out every single day and water them for five years. And for those first five years, nothing would happen. So they basically would water just dirt every single day for five years. But somehow during that fifth year, it started to come up and just a little sprig at first. And when it started to come up, it would grow like crazy. This, this bamboo would grow 90 feet in six months. So more than a foot and a half a day. And so I remember as he was talking, he had me so engaged. And I remember I wanted to almost scream out loud, what was it doing for the first five years? You know, And he told us. And he said, to grow something so strong and resilient that could be in all, in all different situations and could weather that, that for the first five years, it had to grow down. The first five years, what it was doing was it was beginning, uh, it, was, it was putting in an incredible, incredible root system an incredible, incredible root system. And that is what we as parents um, do. And so many times I think it does feel like water, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. But God promises, raise up a child in the, in the way that they should go, that everything that we put into the dirt, every ounce of water that we put on it becomes a part of what will grow from that. And so today um, we're gonna be talking about this idea of, um, of growing little humans, of growing little humans and what it takes to do that, especially what it takes to, to grow faith-filled humans. And I wanted to add right here is a little tiny bit about, you know, what is today's parent? What is today's parent kind of look like as they're trying to water and water and water? And so 
A few things I wanted to say is today's parent is um, busier than ever. Um, they are, um, they have, they're really focused on this idea of building resumes for their kids, a lot of them. And, you know, just, you know, they got to play the sports and school and this and that. And they're almost starting sooner and sooner, like second grade. Okay, we got to, we got to get this sign up, da, da, da. And, and they're spending a lot of time driving and dropping them off at things that the world have, has told them is very, very important. Even Sunday is kind of scheduled. I mean, a day that at one time was just church, you know, Sunday is now up for grabs. I mean, it, it's as scheduled as the other days. And sometimes I think when we see this, we get a little frustrated at the parents and, you know, get your priorities in order and, and the religious education programs or whatever we're providing. But we have to remember that the world has been very loud and really calling parents and, and talking a lot about this in college and all these things. And in the process, the church has been rather quiet in terms of, you know, we basically have parents, you know, we're invite them to come to mass and then to bring their kids to religious education programs that for the most part, they just drop their kids in the class. They run to the market or wherever they're going to go and then they pick them up and go back to life. Um, both parents in, in the majority of homes are both working. Um, high divorce rates, um, a lot of, you know, shared and, and co-parenting. A lot of today's younger parents don't necessarily trust the church and they have, you know, um, they were a part of the hurt and the scandals that came out um, in the history of the church here uh, recently. Um, they are not necessarily finding their community at church. Um, they seem to have found it more in other places, you know, especially in some of the extracurricular things that their kids are doing. And, um, and, and many of them are not necessarily having models or examples of faithfulness in their own homes to, to go ahead and teach them the traditions and how to share faith. They also, um, are not attending mass in the same way as their parents, today's younger parents. And they are the first generation that they're saying doesn't really feel the need to follow their parents necessarily um, in all different things, but it's especially in the ways of faith also. Um, they want to test it. And we're not going to just believe it because you told us to, but if church isn't is it what it says it is, and it isn't kind and loving and encouraging, then I don't necessarily want to be a part, a part of it. And what one of the hardest things to hear is, is that so many of them um, haven't experienced Jesus as good news. And they're saying such a huge amount of um, young Catholics they have seen it more as something that they have to do instead of seeing this Jesus as peace and love and truth. I'm going to give you an example of what I think I'm talking about. Okay, Jillian, you can hold that up. Okay. And it's almost like I want to talk about the life of a family. Okay. And this is the life of a family here. And in here are the millions of things that they have to do every week. Okay, every single week. And so these would be things like school and work and and um, birthday parties, visit grandma, um, baseball, soccer, dance. And, um, and then we get to the very top and there is not any more room, barely. And then we say, okay, here it is. Here's the Jesus rock. And if Jesus and if faith is just one more thing to do, they really don't have enough time. And in a lot of ways, that's how they're looking at it. But in this analogy, Jesus is not another rock. Jesus is water. And Jesus pours in amongst all the other things that we're doing, how we look at all this, 
how we see this, how we experience it. Jesus is the water. Jesus in the midst of baseball. Jesus in the way we see a school day. And so I think one of the most important pieces um, in working with today's families is, is, is not looking at faith as one more thing to do, but looking at it, how it defines who we are and how we see the rest. We were made for meaning. We were made for meaning. And we are constantly in search of it inside of us. We hunger and thirst for it because that's how God made us. And so I noticed that in the midst of if in the midst of meetings that I go into in and out of constantly with parents, that all I need to do is say, I want you to hold your hands. And I want you to put your, your kids, I want you to hold your kids, each, each one of their names in your hands right now. And then I begin to, to bring, to allow them to think about the struggles that kids have, the blessings they have, and then to bring them to God. And every single time, these people that might've seemed too busy, like it was one more thing to do, the minute they encounter Christ, the tears, the thoughtfulness. But one of the problems is they haven't had enough of those moments to encounter him. And when you haven't encountered him as purpose and peace, how can you possibly share him with your children? One thing um, that has happened recently, we know we've been in the midst of this pandemic and, um, and obviously there's a ton of tragedy that has come from it and the lives lost and the unemployment and all different pieces of it. But one thing that also has happened is that parents um, and families have sort of had a Sabbath you know, which used to be this period that the Jewish people had, that they would, this time that they actually for 24 hours lit candles and sat with each other and told the stories and played the board games and did the rituals. And so our families have had some time to be with each other and kind of to remember a little bit about um, what it is to, to sit as families and not just be dropping off and running and chaotic and all over the place. And so our families have had that experience. And I think that is going to be a part of the way that they actually move forward in terms of faith as well. And I'm gonna talk about that. As parishes are beginning to reopen, um, what we're seeing is that um, as far as families is that about half are coming back for like religious education classes. And I guess that makes us ask the question um, is, did they maybe not have a positive enough experience? Um, is there nothing specifically um, their, exper their experience of sharing faith or learning about faith that would bring them back? So I wanna challenge us today to think about instead of waiting for them to come back, is for us to try to support them in their homes and for us to take our, um, our, our faith and our structures and, and, and the things that we believe and the ways that we've been doing it and use that to support them in their homes, to give them tools and resources to have faith conversations, to model how to pray with their kids, to, to teach them how to say the word Jesus in their home so that it comes through their mouths and not just through catechists and to teachers um, and just teachers' mouths. I think the Holy Spirit is calling us to rebuild. I really feel that. And to be more intentional with the people that we have. And so I want to talk a little bit about this rebuilding and looking at the old church that kind of focused on people sharing faith in their homes, then 
beginning intentional small faith communities and then these larger gatherings. And so I'm gonna talk for a little bit about these three different ways that we have to, um, to, talk, to help families share faith in their homes, in small faith communities or at larger gatherings. The first thing I wanna say is any of the things that we do with families, they have to be good. They have to be really good. They have to be well thought out and well prepared and there has to be radical hospitality because too often we put on maybe just like lukewarm events and then when the people start showing up, we say, see, they didn't want this anyway. They're not showing up. They don't want it. And I guess what we need to say is, no, they want good things. How can we, how can we go and meet their needs? How can we um, meet them where they're at? So I want to talk about this idea of church and homes, sharing faith in homes and the how and some ideas on how to do that and how we can equip families as um, catechists and teachers and also talking to just parents, not just parents, parents. Um, the first thing I want to say is um, parents need tools and resources. Um, that are written in a language they can understand and they need modeling and they have to be inspired to want to do it. They have to be inspired to want to do it. One thing I love to do is to really um, talk with families about this idea of rhythms, of how they can create some holy rhythms in their homes. And, and, and for many of these families, you know, the, it's just so much every moment and how can, and so again, it seems like, oh my gosh, you know, faith, one more thing to do, but it's like, no, how can these rhythms just be water and pour through the way that we talk about our day and live through our day? So um, the first thing I really love to do with families and that fam families it can do this on their own, but we also have some resources. So I'm just, there's no, so you can use whatever you have <laughs> yes. in your home. <laughs> but the first thing I like to do is to encourage families to just set up a sacred space in their homes. And because if we have a space with a few things set on there, it's going to make us more, we're going to pass it. We're going to see it. We're gonna, it's going to catch our eye. It's going to remind us. And so we actually work with parishes to create, this is just a faith box. This is for a school, for a parish in San Diego, but where all these things are included. And sometimes I find that if parishes can gift people this, um, sometimes families, if I say, you know what, you've got to go to Michael's and buy these things, they just are like, okay, I don't have time. So sometimes it's nice to be able to gift them some of these things but this is a cloth a cloth that they um would put down this is a candle this is um some holy water they also get where's the saint card they also get a um a saint for whatever parish or this one is saint for saint gregory the great and then they get a set of prayer cards and this has a prayer for the beginning of the day it has a prayer for the end of the day. It, it has a, a simple prayers for, the, for things that happen in the life of a family, a prayer for an, an achievement, a prayer for difficult situations. There's a couple prayers before meals, a prayer to say on someone's birthday. And so by having these prayers that are written in very um, simple language, like I think um, an achievement. God, today we celebrate something special. We worked hard and things turned out well. And now we get to share this moment with those we love. Thank you, God, for our gifts and talents and the blessings we celebrate today. And then it says, decorate your table with any mementos or signs of achievement you are celebrating. For example, a trophy, medal, certificate, report card, et cetera. And so they would bring something here and just read this together. Um, and again, this is just by way of a visual. Um, if you're a parent, I'm sure you have a, some of these items in your own home. If you're a DRE or a catechist, just these types of prompts and prayers to provide for parents, um, because a lot of them do not have the content in the language to pray out loud in their own homes. 
Um, so this is just, again, kind of a visual to share with you this idea of setting up a sacred space in your home. I also love to give holy water or have parents um, get that from church and or sometimes you know, I, I love like if you can give everybody like the beginning of the new year, a bottle of holy water and and then to teach them how to, you know, bless their their kids. And I give them different prompts and things they could say, but, you know, to bless their, you know, their minds, to bless their eyes, to bless their mouth and the words they say, the, the things that they hear. And we have PDFs on that you're going to get at the end of this that are going to talk about a lot of the things that we're talking about. But basically, one thing I'm um, really saying is helpful is for them to set some type of sacred space in their home, and then to to have you know some kind of prayer cards or something that they can use um, to work off of in that space because. And once kids see a space like that, the thing about kids is they are really good about holding parents to task. So, you know, we got to do that. Oh, wait, this happened today. Oh, we got to do that. So they're really good at reminding parents to do it. Um, this idea of holy rhythm then is, you know, is to think about simple rhythms that families can do where they weave God in and out. One thing I love is to talk about the idea of, um, a prayer at the beginning of the day. And I know as a mom, I mean, I always wanted to pray with my kids before school, but it was always so hectic. Come on, let's go, we gotta go, get in the car, you know? And so what we started doing was we would put a prayer, we would pick a prayer spot each year. So on the first day of school, I they each got a chance, depending on the year, to pick that spot, which might be a tree or a target or whatever it is that we pass. And we would just, we just started a rhythm and a ritual that we would, as soon as we passed that tree, we would just begin the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And it was so easy because it was in the midst of what we were doing. So it took maybe two or three days, and then I never even had to say it. As soon as we did it, we would all begin like this. And then we would pray for their teachers. Every day we prayed for their teachers by name. And then we would pray, you know, for dad at work and for, you know, all just different things that could come with the possibility of that day. Another um, great rhythm for families is grace. And, and, and I think a lot of times families um, sometimes don't partake in some of these simple things because they haven't been explained to, to them the purpose of them. And so when I talk to parents about grace, and I talk to them about what grace is, and it's kind of like this blessing that we don't deserve, that we've just been given by this good God. And so I talk to them about the, that that's why we say a grace before we eat, is because we acknowledge that this food is gift, that this food is gift, and that not everybody is sitting down to this today, but we have been given this gracious gift. And so we thank God and then we pray for others who are going to go without today. And so I have given many families just graces that um, they pray now that just talk about a one first thing. Thank you, God, for this food and the people we're eating it with Two, We pray for all those who go without today. And just having that again in the midst of their day at dinner time, at lunch time. And the last thing is the opportunity of bedtime. And if we can give our families um, some simple tools to help them um, share faith at bedtime. And I feel like bedtime is such a great time because, um, you know, it's like, it's just a kind of, just like faith kind of feels like this warm blanket. I think so does that, that idea of bedtime. And so how can we be really intentional about ending our day by talking to God? And one um, simple thing, but you could do this with all different, ways, but is to do an examine. And um, and the Jesuits are famous for their examine and um, St. Ignatius. And it's basically just looking um, back through your day and seeing good things that happened, not so good things, the choices I made, what could I do different? And so what we added to it is just that you would have um, hearts and stones. And so why don't you read a couple of the questions? So take out a heart from your examine bag and ask yourself what was one good thing that happened today. Take out a stone 
and ask yourself what was one challenging thing that happened today. Take out a heart. What was one thing you were grateful for today? Take out a stone. When did you feel the most drained today? Take out a heart. What was one kind thing you did today? Take out a stone. What was one thing you wish you could have done differently from today? And then the last one is, did you feel God's presence today and when? And then there's a small prayer too, I think on the bottom of that, but you can look up examines. But I think the idea of especially having some like items that kind of, you know, sit, sitting by their bed again for kids. And even if you just did one or two of those every night and then some kind of simple prayer, maybe when you bless them, you know, um, I used to say to my kids always, I don't know, sleep with the angels every night, sleep with the angels. And I, I ask parents sometimes, I'm like, if you say sleep with the angels over your kids or, or God be with you tonight or whatever it is. And if you do that every night for, you know, 12, 15 years, you know, what are the chance that our kids are going to bless their kids? Um, and I would say it's like 95%. You know, so if we do it, our kids are going to do it. So some type of evening, end of the day blessing, and some way to have some type of um, conversation about their day and how they saw God in their day. Um, the next one is I'm really trying to encourage families um, just to, to see if they couldn't set aside a little bit of time once a week to have a family meeting. And I kind of picture a little bit like, you know, Sunday night, um, you know, the end before the week starts and, you know, we just sit and meet for 15 minutes all together on the couch. Um, the Mormon church who is having um, the best success with um, retaining families, they have what they call Monday, Monday home evening. And on Monday nights, they are given curriculum in their home to do with their families every single Monday night and on all different types. And it's so beautiful. I've been to those in actual people's homes. And I've been to one in someone's home where the college son was Skyping in on a Monday night because that's what it meant to be a part of that family. But so this idea, again, of a short ritual, a short ritual where you would talk about the week ahead to talk about the week ahead and talk about important things. And I think that's um, another piece um, that, that parents today aren't, aren't used to as much is to have these, uh, you know, faith conversations that point at more important things. And I'm going to show you just this tool. And again, you could do this however you wanted, but this is the idea of this family huddle, a family huddle. So I, I like to call it a huddle because, um, Seems less intimidating than meeting. <laughs> yes. That same thing. And in this one, you get a playbook. Okay. So, um, but this gives you in here all kind of tips on how to meet and what to do. And then, but then it also gives you all kind of prompts for prayers. Just every, that, that each week at some point you would pray together as a family. And it's like, this one is have everyone say the name of someone or something they want to pray for. Um, hold hands together and pray silently for something. When you finish, squeeze the next person's hand and pass it on. Um, sit in silence for a moment and become aware of your heartbeat. Take a deep breath together and thank God for the life he has given you. So these are just simple ways to um, pray. Then there's also prompts for checking in with each other. Um, and just simple ways to talk about our day. Um, again, um, where we saw God in it. Um, a gratitude report. And then there's this one that I love, and that's things that matter. Decision making, faith, the responsibility, peer pressure, bullying, forgiveness and mercy, discipline, equality, social issues, worry and anxiety, that these are, um, these are subjects that we need to be discussing with our kids. And they really, um, reflect our faith and our um, and our belief in those areas. And so just some type of sacred time, especially if you are um, 
faith educators, I think it's great if we can provide our families with curriculum to do at that time, short, simple, experiential, uh, it, very, very um, practical, very, very practical. The next thing I wanted to really talk, one more thing about that is just at all these things that we give families, I just think we have to really point to this idea of sharing good news and this idea of sharing the story of Jesus. And um, I, I, I'm always telling parents like Jesus is, you know, a hero. I mean, he is like the hero that we want our kids to emulate and follow. He's kind, he's forgiving, he's brave, he's courageous. He would care about the environment and the planet, you know, that, and so the more we can talk about him and his life and tell the stories, um, and the more that we can look at it too, I think a lot of our parents today, when we say the word religion, unfortunately, I think we sort of killed that word a little bit. And it sounds like shame and blame and judgment, but maybe this idea of Christian leadership, of what is it to be a follower of Christ? And how can we talk more about him and tell the stories of him in our own homes? And how can we give families resources to do that? The next thing in families, I would say, is traditions. And I think traditions are like the glue that holds families together. And it's the way that we do family, the way that we do a birthday, the way that we decorate our Christmas tree. I think we can give people, just like those prayer cards, we can also give them, you know, blessing cards, things, a blessing to pray for birthdays, a blessing to pray for car keys, for relevant things that happen in the life of a family. Another tradition that I think is beautiful for us to help families with this Advent. And it's kind of crazy because I, I've been working with a DRE lately and she's been interviewing all the parents and she's been saying, she's shocked at how many families, you know, they're saying like, oh my gosh, like we don't, you know, we don't want to miss Jesus as we prepare for Christmas. And then, you know, she'll say, well, then you'll have an Advent. And they're just like, well, what is Advent? And so somehow, we have missed this opportunity to bring, you know, maybe parents, because sometimes if we're just talking to kids about Advent in classrooms, it's not that they're going to be able to go home and instill that practice into their whole family. So I think um, it's great, especially if these people have their little sacred space to send home other tools to help them celebrate different um pieces, life of the church. So I'm going to show you this one Advent resource. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, and sometimes we just get all, it's got to be the purple candles and the pink candles and this and that. And we miss the whole piece of this idea of the reason we even have candles is because we, this God, this light of the world that's coming, this flashlight that's coming to show us how to live. Um, this particular, um, practice. It just comes with the families get, um, cause again, some family, you know, they, I say, don't even, they get a candle. Okay. <laughs> they can also, I kind of talk to them about, they can put some green around, around here. And I talk to them about how, why we use evergreen and it's cause God is ever, um, always alive and just like evergreen. And then they can put a candle here if they have one. And then um, they have a little reflection that looks very family friendly, hope, love, joy, peace. And each one of these reflections talks about a member of the Holy Family. And it ties like hope talks about Mary and a little bit about this idea that Jesus is growing inside of her. And it has um, the mother share um, what it was like to be expecting her kids and to share those stories. And then um, it has a simple, simple practice for each for that they could do during Advent that are very, very family friendly. And then I tell them, you know, then you can just set this out um, as you, you know, just once a week, you, you have your kids read the prayer, um, discuss, there's a couple questions to discuss and then to do the activity sometime that week. And then it tells them that on Christmas Eve, they turn the light of the world is here now. And so then they turn and they have the actual nativity. But you can see how sending a family home with something like this is, is, is a tool. It's written in language they could understand. And especially 
I'm noticing just the blessing of Zoom because you can show, parents can be on and, and be inspired and see how to use this and you can dim the lights and do it with the family and, um, and they can really, it can really be modeled for them. And we know that Advent is soon. <laughs> um, so a simple email each Sunday of Advent with some little activity, a prayer and a reflection for parents and families. I think would be really meaningful this year, especially as um, this year is going to look a little bit different and people are going to be in their homes a lot more. So I think they're looking for that content and that language to have those conversations. We also, at the end of this, you're going to get a PDF. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have a PDF that um, has, uh, it's like six it's Advent at home and there's all different activities. It's free. You can send it to however many people you want, all your families but really simple little teachings and activities to do all throughout Advent and the Christmas season too. And so I like, I think it would be beautiful to encourage families. Like even if you said, how many do you need? And you could, you know, fold, fold those up and put them at each person's place at Thanksgiving. And, you know, remind uh, one grandma was saying, I'm going to have them at each person's mm -hmm. place and then remind them Advent starts on Sunday. Here it is. And it's practical and you can do it. So Again, providing the resources and modeling it if possible, showing how you would use that. Um, also Lent, same thing. I'm gonna talk more a little bit more about Lent later. Um, another thing is this idea of um, moving. So now once families have encountered Christ with each other, um, this idea of how can we also provide opportunities for them to encounter Christ um, in small communities. And the number one thing we really are inviting parishes to do is really saying, if you can interview each of your families, if you can, whether it's on Zoom or in person, and if you can check in with them regularly, it's just amazing how few people know anybody at church or has ha, have had anybody at church ever asked some questions about their family or actually even told them, you know, let me pray for you right now with your family. I mean, so they're, they have very little sense of community um, to the people at church. And so especially if you're in a position of leadership, I cannot say enough the importance and the opportunity of in, interviewing our families. Again, I was talking about this person who, you know, was working with this family about Advent and she was saying to me, she goes, it was so crazy because by the end, and they were giving out an Advent thing. And she said, by the end, I mean, this woman, I had told her and explained her how she could do it. And, and she was so excited to then take that. And then they prayed the first prayer together. So a huge piece of helping families do faith at home is they need coaching. They need coaching. And so I'm really encouraging us, instead of spending so much of our time and resource, resources into coaching kids, is I think we can coach parents who can then teach and lead their kids. Um, trying to assign families to small pods, you know, where they can interact now with five or six families. And this is your kind of your small family at church. And so uh, I think besides just this idea of encountering Christ in different ways, we also have the opportunity and the responsibility to form parents, to actually form parents. And so there's all different kinds of things we can do um, when we have a small group of parents together. And I'm sure some of you have heard about Alpha or the resource formed or, but to have parents actually even watch videos together that are really well done and have conversation with other fam other people who are seeking Jesus can be very, very powerful. Um, if you have a classroom model, I would say um, if possible, if you have a classroom model is to have the parents come in at the end of the class time. And instead of them coming at 4.30 when it's over, they have to come at 4.15. And the last 15 minutes is a prayer time and they bless their kids. Or there's some, again, the teacher's modeling different ways to have faith conversations and different ways to pray. Um, 
I also really love the idea is if you if you have parents and kids coming, if you have always you can another huge opportunity is to have parents meeting separately as kids are meeting. So basically, if you have kids meeting in small classrooms, you know, the parents have to pick them up eventually. So why not once a month have some kind of formational thing for them. So there is this opportunity of how can we teach and pass on faith. Um, and I mean, and that's a bigger than I have time for at this moment. Okay, but 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 realizing that and fi finding best practices to to teach parents who can then teach their kids. Um, many retreats, many retreats. Um, just the idea that um, to have to have kids and parents come to adoration together and to have that actually led by um, someone who is, you know, talking about family things and having the kids and parents talk together and then having them bring it to Jesus. Any little type of facilitated event, prayer event, especially and reflection event um, with families is incredible. The other thing is larger gatherings. So now we want to also realize that they're part of this bigger, their little home church, and then this little maybe family of church, and then this community of church. And so, um, you know, obviously we would love for that community of church to be mass, our central prayer as Catholics, and really encouraging families to come to mass. Um, but also we love to have these periodic, what we call like kind of why don't you explain prayer stations and prayer. Um, prayer stations, which basically are just promptings um, for parents. We have some just that parents would do by themselves, some just for kids, and then also some prayer stations where parents and kids would be uh, praying and doing these stations together. But you would just set up, it could be five, it could be 12, it could be 15 different prayer stations, and each of them have a different theme. So everything from Forgiveness, where you set up little um, cups of water with Alka-Seltzer tablets that dissolve and you kind of prompt them, ask them to think about, you know, something that they need to let go of or someone that they need to forgive in their life and to be praying for that as this tablet dissolves in the water. Another one um, could be all about social justice and um, talking about homelessness and having different photos out and having the child pick up one and praying for that family and their situation and their um, joys and their challenges. Um, another one all about tying knots. And as a parent, what do you worry about every time or think of a list of worries in your mind and every time you think of one, tie a knot in the rope. So there's a million different ones. Um, quite a few are included on the PDF that you can look at, <laughs> um, but it's a no fail because um, a, they're so hands-on, but B, because they're um, done as parent and child, um, parents so oftentimes do not like to pray out loud or don't know how to lead a prayer in their home. And so giving them this opportunity to share that with their child um, is just really special and meaningful. Every single time, and we've done this hundreds of times, parents are constantly taking out their phone, taking pictures because they're not even used, uh, used to something like this. Um, that's meaningful and prayerful and that's happening at church with their kids um, and kind of gives them also that language um, in the future to, you know, oh my gosh, yeah, we prayed about forgiveness, you know, that next Thursday night talking to their kid. Now, remember that? What's, who's another person we could forgive? Um, but kind of leading to also future conversations as well. And so many times these bigger gatherings can be done um, like that one was one that we usually do at Lent time. Mm -hmm. We usually do it during the Lenten time, but we also have a favorite when we do it Advent where they come and the families experience the life of Christ and they go from station to station at one station. They try foods at Jesus. It's just to make Jesus real. So they try foods that Jesus mm -hmm. had eaten and they talk about his mother and his father and um but again, you're providing a space for these parents to have intentional faith conversations with their kids and ways to be able to do that. So they'll be more able to do that than in their own homes. Um, we have tons of different ideas and we put those out like we just put out one for um, Mary for the May. We put mm -hmm. that out this past year. We had a Lenten one. It was called Holy Week at Home. Um, so any of these, you know, you could use to kind of work these into some of the gatherings that you might be able to eventually have at your church, mm -hmm. hopefully soon. 
We can talk about Zoom real quick. Huh? Zoom. But there are many opportunities to do them via Zoom. We've actually been doing them <laughs> quite frequently over the last few months. Um, and to actually have families on, so similar to how we are right now, but each square would be a different family. And leading these types, we've led family meetings on them and kind of facilitated that, you know, talk about a high and low from your day when you're finished, thumbs up. So there's creative ways that you can um, also lead these types of large group gatherings via Zoom as well until um, larger group gatherings are allowed, so. And, but back to that coaching for one second, I can't say enough the opportunity we have in um, this coaching idea of getting um, people, and, and we know them at our parish, people that are, are really good parents um, and people that love, you know, families and children and, and to ask them to interact and, and to kind of coach a pot of small families and to check in and to, you know, what can I pray for, for your kids or, but somehow we are going to have to break that barrier of, of, of getting from our church into these people home and making a connection so that they are gonna come back and be a part of our community and, and worship with us and learn, you know, how to lead their faith, you know, with us. Um, so. I agree, yep. <laughs> Nothing okay. bad. Okay, um, okay, so I'm gonna take, we'll take a few questions because I just kind of want to see who's on here and what you guys are kind of thinking and then we can go kind of in a direction from there because I don't know if we have more parents or teachers or. Oh. Someone's asking, where do you find these resources? Um, like we said, this was um, where we practice what we preach. And so modeling is just really important to us and kind of mirroring whether you have a classroom model, mirroring that, bringing the parents in for the last 15 minutes, like my mom said, and teaching and modeling these different practices and rituals and traditions. Um, so all of these resources that we were sharing are available on our website, faithandfamilycollective.com. However, a lot of them can also be manipulated um, and sent via email or you can make your own, things like that, but they are available online. And if you would like, if you have certain things that you're looking for, you know, specifically, I want to do things for Advent or things for Lent, we can um, kind of, you know, point you in a direction. One thing that we have really tried to do is to really, there isn't a lot, I'm going to be honest, there isn't a lot of really family friendly written in simple language um, beautiful that looks like something a fan that reflects kind of how you would teach and show in a family um, resources so that is kind of you know it's something we're super passionate about and um, we have that but we also could help direct you to definitely a way that you could also you know there's a lot of also another great place to look is um, homeschooling groups you know, homeschooling groups. They have a lot more like hands-on, simple, bite-sized activities for yeah. families, yeah. Anything else? I don't know, Joseph. We're not connected to the Facebook live part, so we're trying to figure that out. We're not? Um, another one, which videos do you recommend for family pods to watch? You know what, I, I okay, I'm kind of split over formed and alpha, okay? I, 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 I sometimes, I. <laughs> you can check out both of those. I, I would, would look at yeah. both of those. Alpha I, is not an explicitly Catholic resource, but it does have really meaningful conversations and questions and the videos are very well done and professional too. And they're, and they have, and actually, if you call alpha, they do have a, a Catholic, you know, a way that they're using it in Catholic parishes. And what I think alpha does is it really kind of responds to the simple questions that whether you are super engaged in church or not, but just like, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of parenting? What is it, you know, so the basic questions that, that people have to ponder at some point and giving them a place to kind of flesh that out and letting that be that seeking be the beginning of wanting to know more. Um, I think that that's, especially if you had, maybe I would say more, um, beginning 
mm. beginning parents, I might start with um, alpha and then informed, I think is for a little bit. Um, next step. Next step. Yeah. Um, one other note is that we've also, if you're a catechist or DRE, um, just because we're not sure how many of each category are <laughs> on right now, um, but we do have resources that are called Mend and Nourish, which is for faith formation programs. And basically all the resources that we were just talking about that are very hands-on, um, et cetera, those, it has the exact same format. Um, but for first reconciliation prep and for first communion prep, it's all led at home. It can be um, kind of also hybrid with the classroom model, if that's what you have. Um, but it is meant to be done in these family meetings at home, either once a week, once a month, depending on how you schedule it as a DRE. Um, but it is very, again, hands-on, family-friendly. Um, and I can also type the um, link to that as well, but just a different way to do faith formation um, if you're looking at bringing families into the mix of it. The other thing with that is I just recently was on a Zoom that was with families that are using um, MEND, our box that we are a part of for reconciliation. And I was wondering what that would be like. And it was the DRE was, you know, there was probably 20 families that were on and they were talking about um, th some of the lessons, a couple of the lessons they had already done. And it was just so beautiful to hear the parents share with each other um, the, the the moments they had had in their home and, oh, we tried it this way. We had our son say the prayer like this and they were learning from each other. And then they had sent in videos because that's a part of it. You're supposed to send in videos of your, doing, of your family doing these things. And just, I mean, I was weeping as I was watching families just, you know, make something with clay, just all the thing and knowing the conversations they were having in the midst of that. So um, I, some of these things you might like, I haven't seen parents do that, but I'm, they're very, very doable. Very, very doable. Mm -hmm. No more questions. No more questions. You can do your closing prayer. Uh -huh. Closing prayer. Would you say so? Mm -hmm. or, okay. Yeah. Okay. What um, I am going to kind of wrap up a little bit here with this, a small little um, prayer reflection. And I think sometimes um, wherever, you know, we have been at and how have we seen our own family, how we've experienced other families in faith formation, um, we get set in kind of a way that we do things. And sometimes it's hard for us to be open to do for, for newer ways of doing things and for ways that God wants to inspire us in new ways. And so um, I want us to do a little tiny experiential closing here. And this is also the example of something I would do with parents, okay? Is the first thing I wanna ask you to do is just to ring off any, just anything negative when you've, when you've thought about family things or any of, or the frustrations or the ways that you thought it had to be done or just to ring that off of your hands right now. And now I want you to just hold your hands for a minute. And I want you to look at those um, at your palms and to know that your hands are opportunity. And that each day, each day we begin anew. And so much of the work that we do is, is in the palm of our hands. And if we call you God into this space, you send us every single time. I love the image of water because I believe that water is, um, it's like refreshment and renewal. And so what I'm gonna invite you to do right now is I'm gonna invite you to go to the closest sink in your home, wherever that is, and for you just to let the water fall on your hands to let the water fall on your hands. And as that water's falling on your hands, to ask God to hold you in the palm of his hands and that he would send you forth from this moment, um, renewed somewhat um, 
back into your family or into your classroom or to whatever sacred ground God sends you to. And so I'd like you for a moment just to go and let the water, just go to a sink, turn the water on, wash your hands, and then come back to your space. Come back to your space. Okay, now that our hands are washed, I'm gonna ask you to really open them wide. Okay, God, God, um, we bring our most precious pearls to you, our own families and the families that we serve. And we just ask that you would renew us with peace and with purpose and with truth and with clarity. We just ask God, that you send us the way that you sent the people that we talked about at the beginning of this meeting, the people that inspired us and led us, God. We just ask that you send us as those people. Use us as your, um, your eyes and your smile and your voice. Amen. We have, um, I saw one last question, and that is, do we have any specific recommendations or resources for teens? And so I was going to say, I, I feel like there's an, a lot of opportunity to do things with teens and parents, okay? And if you email me and you want something, I will send it to you. But I guess what I am finding is that we can um, create intentional um, gatherings where we have provided space for parents and teens to interact together that might not be able to happen in their own homes. And many, many times the parents, when I do these, will thank me because they're like, gosh, I, it helped me have conversations or prayer that I didn't know how to do with my young person. So a couple ideas on that. We do a ton of mother-daughter stuff, okay? We And we love that. And I think that's a great space to begin in mother-daughter, father-son, mm -hmm. however. And any time that you do these types of things for parents and teens, I would say the first thing I usually do is begin by doing some type of, you know, something fun, competition thing they do, some kind of opening prayer, and then to separate. So the parents get filled with something and they get inspired and they get in a really peaceful, a thought-filled space. And then the teens are hearing another person, maybe a younger person, and then they come back together and they have prompts or they go on an, an Emmaus, a short walk together. Or, But they're uh, just every time that that, that happens, this together is different. And so um, I just what, did one last Friday night and, um, and I had the parents for a while and the youth minister had the teens and then they came into adoration together and they had both um, had to pick a scripture and turn a light bulb on they had. And, and then um, they had written each other a short letter and they read it under the light of the light bulb. And I mean, a gathering that had the parents sitting like this next to each other at the beginning was now them down on their knees with, you know, so closely holding each other. I mean, I was just weeping the whole time, but just, you know, if we, any time that we can bring parents together with their kids and, and, and allow them to encounter Christ is so, so, so powerful. So. And then I, um, well, we both have been youth ministers for a very long time. 
And another recommendation is if you do have a retreat is to invite the parents um, at the same time they drop off their teen. Um, the youth minister would have the parents for a short hour and a half to our retreat that would just explain what our retreat is what's going to be happening this weekend, but also some formation for the parents. And then at the end of that retreat bring in the teens to then as she was saying to have that intentional conversation before the parents leave them on the retreat. And a lot of times then we'll have the we'll have the parents pray for the kids and they'll go home and set up a little altar in their house to keep praying for the kids. And but I think um, the opportunity is the whole time in all faith formation is to weave the parents into these things with the kids, because what we're finding out is just to put kids in classrooms and talk at them and, and never have their parents be affected by it. Um, it, it, it no longer becomes a language that they're both speaking. It, it just becomes, again, something they do, not the essence of who they are as family. And I think for too long, we have been thinking that kids could somehow go in and catechize families, that the message could drip somehow up. But I think um, we really see such a, such a benefit in allowing the message to drip down. And um, Joseph is putting in the chat for everyone right now, a PDF, um, which we were talking about before, which has Advent at home, which would be perfect to send to parents and families right now quickly um, for the beginning of Advent that has all sorts of little teachings and rituals and traditions to begin this Advent season. Um, it also actually has, not to overwhelm you, but Holy Week at home um, for Holy Week. Um, which again, same thing, it has a different thing to do each day of Holy Week, including a family um, stations of the cross at the end of the week. And then last but not least, it also has a ton of different parent and child prayer stations that you can literally print or work off of and make your own. Um, but that would be perfect to do either one or two at uh, some sort of a parent meeting or family meeting um, or to do all together if you're having kind of a family event. So that is in the chat at that link. Thank goodness. Well, uh, Pam and Julian, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about, so many helpful, handy resources. I particularly like the image uh, that you gave us of all the, the, the jar with the rocks and that, that Christ is the water that, that fills in all of those areas and, and helps to make them uh, meaningful. Um, and it's not trying to squeeze one more thing in, but but rather, you know, the, the, the air, the, the water around us, the, the what we, we walk in every day. So thank you so much for your insights, for all your resources. Again, for those of you that are in the session, um, we've got the, the link to Pam and Jillian's website and uh, they've got even more ideas that are there. And if you're looking for other resources uh, for, your, for your parish team, if you're a catechist or a DRE or a youth minister, uh, you can get resources and ideas there as well. Um, I, I wanna thank you all uh, in our audience for being here, either on Zoom or Facebook Live. We'll be sending out an email with a survey link uh, and access uh, to the virtual workshop following, uh, following this presentation. In addition, please keep, your, uh, keep yourself on the lookout for our next uh, Faith Connect uh, meeting that'll be happening on January 25th again at 7 p.m. Central Time, um, and that time we'll be taking up the topic of prayer leadership. I appreciated that Pam and Jillian were talking about this already. That so many parents and so many folks uh, don't feel comfortable, even those who've been working in church ministry for a long time, uh, don't feel comfortable leading prayer even with their own families at home. So. Uh, we'll have some other practical ideas for you to think about um, how to lead others in prayer. Any final thoughts? I do see one last question. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> um, how has ministry changed for you since COVID started? How have you adapted and found success in spreading the gospel? And is now the perfect time for us to be promoting the domestic church? Ministry has changed. <laughs> For us during COVID, um, as I said before, we were speaking like four times a week in person um, before COVID, and now we're doing that via Zoom, which has gone surprisingly well. We would say um, an upside of it is that we have seen a lot more people in attendance, I think, because they can 
just log on from the comfort of their homes without coming home from work, getting a babysitter or whatever, and then coming to a meeting. Um, so I think that has been an upside. It's also forced us to get uh, really creative in how we present and um, share in general. We were talking just before this about Thanksgiving and just the creative ways we're gonna have to do that this Thursday. Um, so I do think that the pandemic has um, gotten all of us to get more creative. So I would say that yes, ministry has definitely changed. Um, and I also think it's um, inviting us to go to families. We've heard a lot of ministers say that they're doing home blessings and home visits. Um, so kind of bringing church to their home, bringing the uh, faith formation to their home. Do you have anything? I wanted to say back to that other, because so often when we, when we have parents out for parent meetings and things, and maybe we're even modeling and, and showing them how to do something, um, it's still not able to really penetrate what would that look like with my kids in my home. And so that has been one of the biggest blessings, mm -hmm. I think, is we've done a lot of things with families. We're doing one coming up here with the Diocese of LA, where, so we'll go into people's living rooms, you know, via and, and via Zoom, <laughs> and they'll have a couple PDFs that are sent to them, and we will facilitate, you know, the, the blessings with them, you know, talking about Advent, now go and have this conversation, pass this crucifix around and do this, and, you know, but... Uh, but we will really be able to kind of help lead and guide them into something. And that's not something we were really able, we couldn't really get in that way so much mm -hmm. in people's homes when we were at church. And so I, we have been blown away by what that has been and the response we've gotten from families for that hands-on type mm -hmm. thing. So I think that's probably been one of the biggest things, but I also do think that COVID and has the pandemic has also, it has the blessing of, we kind of are at our home. So it's made us look for ways to reach out to parents that I hope are gonna be ways that we continue mm -hmm. to do that, to provide resources, to provide opportunities for parents in their homes, in their homes. But yes, so it's the perfect time to do it. Yes. It really is the perfect storm, it really is. Yeah. Well, thank again, you. Pam and Jillian, thank you so much for, for everything. And thanks to all of you that have joined us. We look forward to seeing you again on January 25th for our Faith Connect on Prayer Leadership. God bless you and yes. your families. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Right, thanks.